differences between white and non-white people, which is further compounded along the axes of gender, class, socioeconomic class, and migrant status. None of these interdisciplinarities, sorry, intersectionalities is visible more starkly than in academia, which is a microcosm of British society. There is an image what, of what intelligence and belonging looks like in academia, and that image continues to perpetuate itself through the survival strategy of structural disadvantages of non-white people. The legacy of colonialism is still alive in universities, not just in the names of the buildings, like how I was talking about John Maynard Keynes, but also the structural inequalities which are inherent in the system. The project of decoloniality is the project of self-determination. It is to reclaim our own agency. Decolonizing academia has to mean more than just a diverse curriculum or fallen monuments. It has to be reflective of what the impact of the structural inequalities is on those that grapple with them most. It requires us to acknowledge the fact that the system is colonial to begin with, and that is what you are here today to do. By attending this event today, you have acknowledged that there is work that needs to be done. And through that, ask questions of what being part of a colonial system means. It needs us to disrupt the idea that some belong less at the university due to their race, caste, class, gender, and migrant status. A decolonial academy is one that dismantles structural privilege and resists against forces of inequality. As Professor Karen Salt suggested in her keynote at the March conference, we cannot keep planting trees and hoping them to turn out healthy when the soil is toxic. Instead, we must ask ourselves why the soil is toxic and what is in this soil. Decolonizing in an environment as this also requires us to think about a sustainable form of survival for ourselves without fetishizing decolonization and resisting the co-option. Transforming the toxic space in a manner that undoes the internal biases and recognizes the various intersectionalities relies on empathy and humanity as a praxis in, in decolonizing. It moves the conversation beyond just the students, just the teachers, it moves outside of the classroom and engages with the lived experiences of cleaners, of security, of kitchen staff and administrators, everyone that makes our daily lives possible in this space. Embodying decoloniality in the present, instead of constraining it to, sp to sporadic moments, is how we move towards an ethical university based on an equitable principle. Undoing the everyday onslaught of institutional racism and other structural inequalities calls for cultivating an everyday decolonial, here and now, on our terms. Thank you. I'm pleased can I introduce uh, Professor Tony Williams, Head of School, Head of Law School, to introduce our keynote speaker. Thank you, Sarah. I'm really delighted to be here. Um, as Ray said, I'm head of the law school, and I'm delighted to be head of a school where at least one in ten of the permanent academic staff are people of colour. Uh, we could do a lot more, um, but that is something that I'm very <coughs> proud about, and, is, and we are a fantastic collection of academic staff. I'm also very proud because the law school students were very much amongst the leadership um, of the decolonising the curriculum, uh, project that was led by our own um, Sarah Jivraj. So uh, this is something that was really important to who we are as a law school, uh, who we want to be, how we want people to see us. Um, and uh, as I, I, I have to say I'm really excited. When I first came to Kent, which was about 12, 15 years ago, um, I looked around for, a, for some um, colleagues of colour mm -hmm. to try and create a network such as this. Mm -hmm. And um, there were a few, but it... Uh, didn't really fit into anybody's life at that time. So I, it really is quite a thrill uh, to see the, um, the development, the manifestation of these two networks. And I look forward to watching um, with some excitement to seeing how they develop. Um, I am, though, right now, utterly excited and thrilled to be in a position to introduce our distinguished speaker, Professor Heidi Mitzer who is um, this is a visiting professor of race, faith and culture at, at Goldsmiths and professor emerita in equality studies at the UCL Institute of Education. Uh, professor Mertz's work is known to many people in this room. She's done truly pioneering work 
on race, faith, culture, gender, black British feminisms, multiculturalisms, post-colonial theory and educational inequalities. Obviously, those things have been intertwined and tied together in her work. Uh, Professor Mertz's first book, the first of many, I would add, Young, Female and Black, uh, which was published in the early 1990s, 1992, 1992, I think, is groundbreaking in every sense. If you haven't read it, you should. It influenced university students and researchers, of course, uh, and has done since its publication. Even now, almost 30 years after it's published, I think it's still being used as an A-level text in schools across this country. Um, and according to the British Educational Research Association, it is amongst the most influential educational studies in Britain. Uh, that's just one. I, I mean, that's, that's an accolade for Professor Mitz's first major work, her book. Um, she is uh, one of this country's very first female black professors. There still aren't very many, and her, Professor Mitz is, was one of the very first. Um, and her work has received numerous, she's received numerous honours, prizes and accolades for her work. I'm just going to uh, illustrate with a couple. Um, she, not very long ago, she won the Media Diversity, Diversified 8 uh, Award, which was celebrating women of colour in the UK. Uh, around the same time, Professor Mitzer was um, the artist, Tracy Satchwell, selected uh, Professor Mitzer as one of 50 Magna Carta women. And this was the year 2015 when the UK was uh, celebrating or engaging with the 800th anniversary of the Magna Carta, familiar perhaps to law students. Um, and this project by Tracy Satchel was a social history. It produced a collage of women who'd made a significant contribution to furthering women's rights and freedoms over the past 800 years. And Professor Mitzer was amongst uh, those selected. Uh, it was one of the, the very few women, and I don't know how many other women of colour, I'm not sure, black women, I don't think there were any others uh, selected for that. So that it gives you some sense of the impact she has had um, in, in this country, uh, that she would be selected for that. And in the same year, 2015, Professor Mitzer was chosen to give the 50th anniversary Martin Luther King lecture with Doreen Lawrence in St Paul's Cathedral, in St Paul's Cathedral. And uh, in reflecting on that experience in another accolade, in that same year, 2015, Professor Mitzer uh, is featured on one of the big funding councils, the, ESR, the um, Economic and Social Research Council Funding Council. Which it was their 50th anniversary in 2015. Lots of big things happened in 2015. <laughs> it was the University of Kent's 50th anniversary. It was the FRC's 50th anniversary. Oh. Rose was full. Uh, 800 to Magna Carta, all sorts of interesting juxtapositions, I think, for a post-colonial, uh, right for a post-colonial take. Anyway, um, in reflecting, so Professor Mitzer was featured on the funding councils, uh, out, they did a series of Outlook um, pages featuring major scholars in this country uh, whose work had made an enormous contribution uh, to social research. And Professor Mitzer is one of the scholars featured. And in and reflecting on, um, on, uh, on that experience of giving the Martin Luther King lecture with Dor Doreen Lawrence, Professor Mitzer commented, young people want and need to be inspired and we have to dig deep and draw on the wisdom of those who went before us to power us onwards in our struggle for social and racial justice. I think those are... Um, those are it's rare to think truer words were spoken, but that inspiration is not just needed by young people, it's needed by all of us. And I think Professor Mirza, throughout her professional life as a public intellectual, as an intellectual leader, educator and scholar of education, society and social justice, she served as inspiration to students, to colleagues and the wider community. It's a very great privilege to welcome you here to the uh, University of Kent this evening, Professor Mitzer. Look forward to hearing what you have to say. Thank you. I think that's just about the nicest introduction I've ever had. <laughs> yeah, and it shows you're a very good researcher. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Tony, uh, for those warm words. And it's indeed such an honour for me to be here. Am I speaking loud enough? Um, this one. Is this better? Is this better? No difference? Is this better? Yes. I know, but it's a big war between us. Um, we must have a window. Is it on? Hello. I do speak loudly. It's 
I've been lecturing for 30 years and I think that I've learned to throw my voice. Um, but um, I want to start by saying what a gift it is to be here amongst such a warm collective of people doing such great work. My colleague uh, Jason Arde came to the um, conference that you had, the Decolonize UK conference, and he texted me in the middle of it and he said, it's the best conference <laughs> in my life. <laughs> so, you know, you guys are obviously doing something, if Jason could say that. Um, and I want to begin by doing a tribute to those who have gone before us. And Tony, you, you, you picked that out of the things that I, I said. And it's something that I think when we're talking about the process of decolonizing, this is where we have to start with ourselves, our families, and who we are. And it's, it's a very big project. But, you know, we are educators. We are being educated and we are educators. And I want to pay tribute to the women, particularly, who labor in the field of education, as they are what I would call transformative agents of change. And we are all transformative agents of change. And we bring our knowledge and wisdom, and we get our knowledge and wisdom through them. And I want to start by looking at my grandmother. So my grandmother, in the turn of the um, 20th century, she was in Trinidad. And she's just one such woman, an unsung hero, and in our lives, and if you think of your grandmothers, your, you know, your aunts, your uncles, you know, they are unsung heroes. And she became, she was converted by the Presbyterian missionaries in Trinidad. And she became what was called a Bible woman. And she used to go around through the bush and teach women to read using the Bible, because that's the only thing they had. She was one of the earliest... I would call anti-colonial, you know, activists. She didn't have that title. She didn't know about what that would mean. But her actions are the thing that made her change people's lives. So, you know, it's what we call learning by doing. That is what she engaged in, which is the same thing that the women in the civil rights movement did. Learning by doing. So there are people, we hear of Martin Luther King, but we don't hear about Ella Barker, who actually made, um, you know, the, 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 she drove the, um, the uh, voter registration program, which made people sign up and brought about the civil rights uh, movement. But we don't hear about these unsung women. I argue in some of my work that, um, that they form a quiet riot. You know, we often think of change being about the masculine arena where you're on the streets campaigning for change. But these women do quiet work every day, educating, changing from inside, and they are not, you know, they're not valorized for that. So I think that this, this is where we need to begin, looking back to understand the future. To decolonize means to actually bring about a thought revolution, as my colleague Gumindo Bambara says, a thought revolution to think about what it means, not just putting on um, people of color on the curriculum. It means changing the frame of how we think and who is in that frame. I just had a wonderful experience yesterday. Um, I was at the launch of the blue plaque for Bob Marley. Because, um, you know, I sit on the Committee for English Heritage, which is, of course, where a diversity committee, where else would I be? And, um, <laughs> and, you know, for 20 years, there's been a campaign for that blue plaque. And it's been turned down continuously. And it's David Olasugo, myself, and uh, um, Caroline Bressy, and Steve Martin are on this committee. It's a tiny committee. Um, we don't even get biscuits, <laughs> you know. Um, but we, can, we, we, we found the cold case. It had been lying in the, um, the archives, and we brought it back, and 
yesterday after a you know couple of two or three years did you see it on the news yeah it was incredible it rained a lot but <laughs> it, it's about the intertwining of Bob Marley's life as a Jamaican mixed race his father was white British this is what colonialism is, colonialism is. it's about the intertwining of this island with those islands in the Caribbean, with India, with Africa, and the idea that Britain somehow is a white nation is a total mythology. We, our lives are intertwined. So I think that that plaque means to me so much more um, than just a plaque on a house. It's actually speaking volumes about the intertwining that Britain has always been multicultural. You know, even before the imperial empire, there's always been a flow of people through, through these islands. And, it, and that's no different. Um, when I was at university in the 1970s, um, uh, uh, it was an incredible time because it was the moment of post-colonial birth of, of Africa and of India, um, and we were just getting our independence in the Caribbean. Um, Rhodesia was becoming Zimbabwe, and um, I was in a halls of residence um, at the University of East Anglia. And we, anybody who was of colour, and you'll be so shocked, in the 1970s, not that long ago, maybe for some of you, but not for me. <laughs> but um, we were put in a separate halls of residence. So anybody who was from overseas or black British, Indian, um, African of African descent or Indian descent were put in a separate halls of residence. It wasn't considered in any way problematic, but what it did is something what's happening here in this room right now. It allowed me and all of us to get to know each other. And one of the people that I got to know is actually the king of Tonga now, Tukuahu. <laughs> and um, he did have a bit of a crush on me, but... <laughs> talked about the ancestors and he said you know um, uh, in the West he'd say you're always looking to the future you're always wanting something more you know aspirational you're always climbing to the next qualification the next uh, opportunity um, we're driven we strive forward so we're always going forward and he said what we do in Polynesia, in the islands in the Pacific, is we walk backwards into the future. And I really like that idea. You're not, you look backwards to your ancestors and to your roots and where you come from. Because that is the knowledge and the wisdom that you take forward. So instead of going this way, you go that way into the future. And I just think that's a really powerful way of thinking about the work of decolonizing, building on the past, building on those, um, those, those deep roots. Um, so it's not just a cut and paste job of changing a curriculum, but it's actually about changing your pedagogy, the way you think, the, the kind of historical roots from which you've come, which have been largely ripped out of us. Um, but what I want to focus on in this talk is three things. Um, how well, firstly, I want to say that I do always use a black feminist analysis. And a black feminist analysis places the body at the center of the discussion and of the analysis. So it's how we explain things through the experiences that we have. And it's, it is hard work. And in this talk, I want to look specifically at the intersection of race, class and gender and how it lives out in the hopes and the dreams and the realities that we face within what I call the teaching machine. The teaching machine is what encapsulates us. It's what, you know, we call it the institution, we call it the organization, but it's a machine. And um, 
I've just been examining a thesis actually this week. Um, um, you won't believe this. It's on the goddess movement, the white goddess movement. You know, in Glastonbury, mm -hmm. kind of clumps <coughs> around um, crystals. And um, and what this student is saying, she's developed this thing called arachnopolitics. You know, arachnophobia. Mm -hmm. What is it? And it's like a web. And she's talking about how these women um, appropriate and co-opt the goddess in Hinduism or in you know, other religions and bring it in you know, a bit of Buddhism, a bit of um, you know, goddesses in, in ancient Greece. They bring it all in to this big melange um, without any reflection that that might be a problematic act to just cherry pick things and bring it in and, and, and form something new. There's nothing do wrong intrinsically in trying to create something new out of something um, ancient, but you have to acknowledge where they, it comes from. And what she's called this thing called is called arachna, arachna politics, the way that things are absorbed and brought into the into the fold. And, and so I think universities do that. You, this teaching machine, um, there's a, a very um, prominent um, theorist called Elspeth Probin in Australia, and she talks about affective eduscapes. And affective eduscapes is about capturing the hopes and dreams of students, overseas students, the aspirations of of people who uh, live in countries where the parents save up all the money to send their children to European countries so that they can get a better education. They're caught in the web of meritocracy. They're caught in the web of wanting a better life for their children. They, and the universities, our universities, trade on that. They've commodified the education system and you pay high fees now. So the hopes and the dreams are actually part of a machinery of profit. And I think that's a really important thing to understand, that when we're talking about decolonizing, we've got to imagine and think about this web in which we're all captured. Because wouldn't you want your children to do well and go to the best universities? And that's why we still have elitist structures in the system because we are complicit in that. So also I want to think about how do we as students and professionals um, and researchers, how do we navigate this teaching machine, these monolithic systems, and they are monolithic. Um, how do we do that at times of rapid social change? We've got huge changes in technology going on um, that are fundamentally changing the way that we teach and the way that we think about education. Um, massive online courses, MOOCs they're called, or just, um, you know, I, I often think that we're going to become defunct, Tony, you know, because they'll just make videos and put us online and they won't have to pay us anymore. And that's, that, yeah, that will be the future, we'll just be YouTubes. It's, and, um, and so, you know, how do we navigate the cracks in the system? Because it's so monolithic. What we're doing here in this network launch is actually we're just a crack. We're finding a crack in the system so that we can express ourselves and that we can come together and feel whole. But it is a crack. And it, it's very much draws on the energy of the few. And I know I was talking to Soraya, where is she from? <laughs> she's, see, she's collapsed with exhaustion. <laughs> because that's what it does. And I've done a lot of research looking at black supplementary schools. And this again is the work, the quiet riot of, 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 of women's labor to teach in these schools, which are the Saturday schools in, in Caribbean communities, uh, you know, Turkish communities, Greek communities, whatever, you know, 
they're the schools that are outside the mainstream. And those schools only work by the labor, the love, and the sacrifice of largely women, unsung women in those places, which is exactly what's happening, because you said how exhausted you were, Soraya. And, um, and so we have to understand that, and also in universities, which I came across when I was speaking to some of you earlier, was the fact that after three years, you're going to move on. And those who are left behind, your tutors have to pick it up again and keep it going. So the sustainability is always a challenge. The sustainability of how we keep that change going in a very hostile monolithic system. And what are our, thirdly, I, I, I want to draw out, what are our, what are our decolonial pedagogies of resistance? So we need to talk about resistance. What are the other ways of knowing that sustain us? And when it's a new term, uh, it's always, you have to crank yourself up, you know, October's coming and you've just had your summer and you know what's going to face you when you're a, a professor or a tutor um, or an administrator or you're starting a new course. You know you've got to crank yourself up for what it takes. And I went to um, uh, a meeting the other day uh, of teachers and they said, you know, we used to love our jobs. We used to want to come into work every day. I'd lost the fire in my belly. You know, that fire and you just, you think you can change the world. And they said, oh, we've lost that fire in our belly. How can we get it back? So I want us to think about that today, getting that fire in our bellies, you know, the will to, to keep going on, the yearning that we feel for social justice. We need to have that in our lives. So this is a picture here of um, the um, Me Too movement. Do you know the Me Too movement? Mm -hmm. In um, 2015, well, again, that was 2015 was a very big year. It was Roads Must Fall, where the students in South Africa and here in Oxford, um, you know, sought to bring down kind of the, the symbols of establishment. Um, uh, and Me Too was also about something like what you're doing here in the network, you know, making, using social media actually to, to say, well, you know, um, I don't want somebody coming up and say, can I touch your hair? Or is your dad a drug dealer? Or, you know, this kind of thing. Or, aren't you lucky to be here? I'm sure your parents have sacrificed a lot. You know, you know assumptions that people make. And they're just saying, you know, we're human too. And this is all about, you know, um, the misrecognition. The misrecognition of black humanity. It's constant. It wears you down. If you wear uh, a veil, and I did for many years, you know, you know, the assumptions people make about you as soon as you walk into a room, you know, um, it's, something's going on here. <laughs> yeah, those things become very difficult for us to, to manage. And what is even more interesting is that we are now in a new terrain or struggle, I think, around race. 50 years, it's been over, actually it's now 55 years since we've had race equality legislation. It's a whole lifetime, it's my lifetime. Um, and we've moved from the legislation in the 60s and uh, in, in America, the civil rights legislation, and the, the anti-discrimination legislation in Britain, to what is largely now a tick box exercise around diversity. So even though we have probably the most progressive legislation in the world in Britain, I mean it's incredible, you're lawyers here, <laughs> you know, it's not enacted because there are so many cracks in that system. You know, in order for you to bring a case, you know, you have to have a comparator, they are always, and then you now you have to actually pay, um, pay lost legal aid. So you can you can know that 
an injustice has happened, but it's very difficult for us to then take that forward. So the legislation is there. They've also watered it down, the um, Equality Act. And I worked very, very much with Lord Lester on the um, 2010, no, no, 2010 um, Equality Act. God, um, the years are just slipping by. And um, uh, where we brought intersectionality in, but actually it wasn't real intersectionality. Race and gender still remained apart from each other. But what I want to say is that this new terrain is unlike any other I've seen in the race, in the race field, because unlike in the 20th century, we had what Dubois called the color line. We had apartheid where people were separated. We had Jim Crow. We had the, you know, the racism in Britain. You know, no blacks, no Irish. It was it was allowable. We had systems of separation. Now we don't. It's what um, Patricia Hill Collins calls, we now have the politics of containment instead. So we haven't got that harsh division, but we now have this politics of containment. And now it's actually argued we are in post-race times. Do you know what that means? That means we are beyond race and we should be colorblind. And I don't know if you've seen the big thing with um, Naga Muchetti uh, in, yeah. the, in the papers. Uh, you know, we live in a world of double speak, where you can say that something may be racist, but you can't say someone is racist. It's like the biggest crime to call somebody racist. And in fact, look what happened to her. She, you know, denounced Trump. I'm just doing a shorthand here. And, and for having that opinion and saying that what he's not just, it was okay they said that she said, what he said could be deemed racist. It's the fact that she said he, he could be racist. Well, it was implied, but you know. Um, so then we live in this time of performativity of race. And I, you must know the work of René Edo Lodge and others, you know, why I'm not gonna talk about race anymore. Because it's all about performativity. You can say you're not racist, and therefore you're not racist. It's like a strange, 1984 world where you you know where you you know something's clearly racist but it's not racist it's what what did they call the young people woke you can be woke <laughs> you know I'm woke about race I can be as racist as possible but once I say I'm woke I, you know I'm I'm beyond it um, and so we live in this kind of um, strange moment of um, of where race, and this is really worries me about decolonizing, because I've mm. seen so many versions of how our institutions co-opt what we say. Mm. So I have seen, and, and Miri, you're here. Miri, she just left. Oh, well, well, Tony or any of you of my generation, you know, we had anti-racism in the Sorry. 80s, and we had. What did we next? We had um, diversity. Um, we had various forms of multiculturalism yeah, before yeah, diversity. Yeah. And then we had social cohesion. And, um, and, and then we had diversity. And now we've got decolonizing. So all happens is that the university takes those titles because basically we're still all been doing the same thing. Anti-racism in the 70s and 80s is very the same argument now is decolonizing. There's nothing new about it. And they have co-opted it and given it back to us <laughs> and so, as, as, as policies. Um, and Sarah Ahmed, my wonderful colleague, she talks about, you know, this again, the performativity of diversity policies and now decolonizing uh, policies, which is that, you know, it, they become bits of paper that are pushed around and signed off, but nothing really changes. She calls it the walls, mm -hmm. diversity walls. You just keep banging your head against the wall. And they go, well, we've got this policy. And you go, yeah, but nothing's changed. So there is this, this, this kind of double speak. And not only do we have this double speak, but we also have a backlash about equalities, a huge backlash, which 
it manifests itself in one of, um, uh, I don't know your name, but you talked from, about your experience of white fragility. It, I call it white hurt. So that, you know, there's this sense in which people feel that people of colour have had unfair advantage through equal opportunities policies, that you have a leg up. This has happened to me all my life. I was told, yes, you got a chair because you were there at the right time, at the right place, saying the right thing. Not because I earned it, but because I got a leg up. And when actually the day I was, you know, um, there was some drink celebration when I started working, it was a Middlesex University in the 19, 1998 or something, when I got my chair and we were having a drink stew, a wh older white male professor, and there's none in this room, <laughs> came up to me, that's an interesting observation, <laughs> um, came up to me and said, they're giving anyone chairs for anything these days. And he was so bitter, he was so angry that I should have a chair. Of course it was a chair in race equality, well, what else would they give me, but you know, uh, but it was, it's that sense in which there's this white hurt, this unfair advantage, as if there's special pleading, I call it. You know, this assumption that we're here for special, because of special pleading. So, you know, if you're a student of colour, you've come into the university, uh, you know, maybe you got a special scholarship. You couldn't be that clever, you know. And that's what the Me Too kids are saying. They're going like, you know, that's what people come up to us and say. You know that maybe you're there by special by special pleading. So I think that we're in this particular neoliberal moment um, of of um, of change, and there is a new language of race, and I think that's very important. So we've got this white hurt, we've got this backlash, we have decolonization, which is another form of anti-racism. We've got you know diversity being, a, 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 you know, ineffectual for years. We're also calling what we used to call widening participation, um, it's now called student success, which is, again, the same thing. And universities get huge funding for these things, but nothing changes. So we really have to ask why. But the new language of race is very much around securitization. It's around, you know, the threat of the other. The threat, I mean, all of you must go to the airport and get tapped down and, you know, go through, you willingly give up everything on that conveyor belt, you know, in your glass of water, which I'm going to have. Um, but, um, you know, I don't know what taking women's baby bottles will do for... Um, anti-terrorism, but obviously it seems to be what we do and what we willingly give up without question. So there's this fear, and again, Sarah Armitage, she says, fear sticks to certain bodies and not others. It sticks to black bodies. It sticks to Muslim bodies. And this is the discourse that we're in at the moment. Um, so we've got to keep that, that vision and that view of, of the terrain in which we're struggling when we're talking about decolonization. Um, mm -hmm. It's not easy to survive in our institutions. How am I doing for time? Is anyone timing me? Mm -hmm. um, it's not easy to be in our organizations. Um, I've written a piece called um, being one in a million. You know, I've often been the only person in a committee meeting, the only person of colour in, in my, my class or the only person in my university, even, you know, early on. And it's, it's tough. And even if there's, like all of us here, you'll be spread out in your courses and you, you're just very isolated. And like you were saying, Tony, you know, you wanted to reach out, but you're under so much stress that you haven't got the time, you know, because you, you can't be seen to fail. You've got to produce those, that work. 
So you are constantly in a, in a difficult position. So to be one in a million is difficult. And very often you're seen as the exotic or the abject other. And this exoticization and you know, being the abject, you know what I mean by that, outside of any kind of normality, that you're always asked to account for yourself. And even by being asked, well, help us to help yourselves. This is um, uh, a critical race theorist called Zio, uh, Zias Leonardo talks about the problem of safe spaces. He says, because this is a fundamentally racist society, and inviting people of color to tell us how to be as white people, how we could be less racist, is not a safe space for people of color. Because we have to become, we have to tell them, why should we? Because it's they who have to change. We cannot tell them how to change. So, um, you know, safe spaces are indeed a, a whole kind of problematic issue about how we form them, how we structure them. Um, and I'm going to do a workshop tomorrow about some of that. How do we construct safe spaces? Um, but I'm not going to do that now. So, how do we occupy spaces of whiteness in our institutions? Nirwal Puar has talked about black bodies, Asian bodies, as being space invaders. We invade a space that was not designed for us. We're not meant to be here. This, this is a, uh, our universities and our institutions are not made for people of color or for women. They were made for men. They're structured around their career system. You know, it's not made. If you, I have so many fabulous doctoral students, women mainly, and they reach at 35 and go, Heidi, I really need, you know, I want to have a child. I want to get married. I want to settle down. But I won't have enough publications and I'll never have a career in academia, blah, 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 blah. Do you know what I'm talking about, Tony? You know, because the, it's too, the stringencies of an academic career mean that if you take time out to have a child, you won't have the publications for the ref. You know? So, and, or you won't get the scholarship, or you won't get the postdoc, because you are going to have children at some point in time. So the, what I'm saying, the career system is based on men with wives. That's why, you know, <laughs> you've got to have this system. Um, anyway, that's a whole, I can tell you another story, but I'm not going to tell you that. So <laughs> space invaders. And um, what happens is, is that institutions become sedimented over time. They become sedimented historically. This is what Nirmal Puar is arguing. So that only certain bodies are meant to be in those places. So when we're talking about institutional racism, it's about um, whiteness as a kind of silent space of privilege. It's silent, but it's everywhere. There was a, a very good book written in the, in the 90s by somebody called Ruth Frankenberg on whiteness. White women. I think it's called White Women. I can't remember the title. But this book... She says when she interviewed white women about race, and many of them were married to men of color, they'll go, oh, I'm so boring. I'm nothing. I'm nobody. I'm like white bread. Whereas exotic people, people of color, were interesting. And, you know, um, yeah, they weren't boring like white people. And this is what she said, is that whiteness is like flat. It's like you don't see it because it's everywhere. And so she says, you know, people of color like Heinz 57 variety. We're seen as a variety, you know? <laughs> Whereas whiteness, there's nothing. We're boring. We're nothing. Nothing. Nobody. We're nobody. But they're everybody. So this silent space is sedimented into the institutional fabric. Um, 
And it's so interesting, my, my colleague Diane Ray, who writes on class, she said, when she, in education, she says, in fact, she was my student who became a professor at Cambridge. <laughs> it's amazing. Um, but she said, you know, constantly, working class white young people say to her, I can't go to Oxford or Cambridge. It's not for people like me. And how many times have you heard this? It's not for people like me. It's kind of like a self-censoring, because you know you won't fit in. And then what the system says is, well, we gave them a chance, but you didn't take it, you know? But because the dropout rate is so high, and if you're doing stuff for wedding participation, it's high because you don't fit in. Not because you failed, because that's what the neoliberal um, um, construction of, of identity is at the moment, that you are at fault if you fail. Mm. You are responsible for your own failure. You are, res you know, and if you meditate enough or something, you'll get better, <laughs> but you know. So there's no structures. You are now free-floating subjects with choice. And we have discourses around choice. You choose what school, you choose what university, you choose everything. And these discourses are really powerful because we buy into them. And so, you know, um, uh, it, it, they, they're hard places to be in universities. And, and I, I do love this quote. It's one of my favorite people, Kathleen Casey. It's a book that she wrote in 1993. And it's now out of print, which is such a shame because it's such a powerful book. And it's called um, I Answer With My Life. And it's about teachers. Teachers who give up everything to work in, in the ghetto, it is in, in this America, in, the, in tough, hard places. Um, she looked at Jewish nuns. She looked at um, African-American women. She looked at... Um, not Jewish nuns, it would be Catholic nuns, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> Jewish women. She looked at different groups of women, and, um, and this is what she said about what the black women uh, said to her. She said, young black women set off into the white world, carrying expectations of mythic proportions. Their odysseys, they believe, will transform their lives. But separated from their cultural communities, these young women's passages turn out to be isolated individual journeys into the heart of whiteness. Isn't that powerful? You set out with hopes and dreams and aspirations. This is the arachna politics. The web captures you and you've got these hopes and dreams but actually you turn out isolated, tough, in the heart of whiteness. And Bell Hooks, you might know her work, she's a black feminist writer, she talks about how when you cross over to the other side, meaning like you come from a working class background, you come from an ethnic minority background, and you go to university, you cross over into another world. And it's really hard to go back. Because she said in her life when she was growing up, there was actually a railway track, and the college was on the other side of the track. And she crossed over. You can't go back because you've changed. You're in that white world. And she said, the only way you survive and you, is to decolonize your mind. Bob Marley. You know, to decolonize your mind from mental slavery, in a sense, you know, is not to forget who you are on that journey. There's a person called Ogbu who's written about acting white. It's a problematic idea. But, some, and, but, but what happens, in, and, and also, Patricia Hill Collins has talked about this as well. What happens when you're in these spaces is that you actually have to put on a mantle in order to survive them. And she says, um, Patricia Hill Collins, she says that you are constantly watched, constantly watched when you're a person of color, working class, gay. So if you stand outside of the system, you will be constantly watched to make sure that you are assimilated. Because if you stand out, you are a threat. You must be assimilated. So, you know, you can't be different. And what Bell Hook says, what, how you keep alive 
in these spaces is through food, taste, smell and memory of all the things that you are, of all the things you have been. You know, I know that we do this silly multicultural food exchange business, you know, like in the 80s we used to call it samosa saris and steel pan. It was like multiculturalism or International Day where you all wear your clothes and have flags. You know those days? Do you have them here? Mm. Yeah. Yeah. See, look, that, that, we're 40 years old, 50 years old, we'd still do that. And one side, it's shallow, it, not shallow, it's shallow uh, inclusion because you just, you know, celebrate your differences and have s exchanged some Moses, where sorry is. <laughs> sorry, Yamika. <laughs> and, uh, you know, but you know, but on the other hand, it, the reason those students go to that and love it is because we get to share and remember who we are. And there's a, um, a black, um, um, Patricia Williams, mm. uh, a black lawyer in America, and I had wonderful experience of sharing a platform with her in Cambridge the other, about, about a year ago. And she says, <coughs> she talks about this thing called double consciousness. Mm. And it's, it's what it was, the notion yeah, of double consciousness. Mm. And she says, you know, after a hard day in the system, in that teaching machine, she says, sometimes I don't even know my name. I can't remember who I am. I'm so shattered by the experience. And then she said, I can't even say a loving word to those I love when I go home because I just feel so destroyed by the experience. And then she says, you know, I'm walking along the street going home and I see... Um, you know, the glass windows of a shop? And she says, I look into that glass window and I see the whole me. So she feels fragmented, but then she can see, and she says, I remember I'm a whole person when I see my reflection. And she has to keep that in her mind. You know, she cannot, she says, I don't ever recognize myself, but then I do. So we always have to go back to that, that, that sense of who we are. How am I doing this? What does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> it means going to do so well. <laughs> I haven't even got through halfway, so I, but I'm going to just I'm just rambling. So five minutes. Okay, where do I go? I'll continue one, and then I'll just. Okay. I want to talk about how do we engage with different knowledges? How do we, whose stories do we hear? And who has the power um, to tell stories? And for me, this is a story that's followed me around. Because in 19, no, 20, I can't even remember, 2003. I was on a commission for African and Asian heritage. Those were the Liv Ken Livingston days. And, um, and we get to, you know, people of color don't go to museums very much. And it's a shame because there's such a lot there. We need to engage more in the museum sector, but that's another story, we'll talk about that. But I'd never been to the Museum of London and I'd lived in London for like, 50 years by then, and I, I, it was just incredible. There was this photo, it was a crumpled photo at the very back of the suffragettes, which were also at the very back of, of the museum. And I thought, bloody hell, there were Indian women suffragettes. I never knew that. Did you know that? No. Why would you? The movie came out, and <laughs> what can I say? And then I had to share a platform with um, the director, Sarah Gavron, at the British Library, and we were talking about archives and things, and, and the suffragettes, because it was 2018 and it was the anniversary of the suffragette movement. And I tackled her on it. I said, why weren't they, there were Indian women suffragettes? Why weren't they there? And she could, you know what she said? They didn't fit the narrative. No, really? Oh. They decided to leave them out. Wow. They didn't wow. fit the narrative. 
And then they got Meryl Streep and everything to wear T-shirts mm. that said, I'd rather be a rebel than a slave. And they thought that was great. They thought that was not problematic. I'd rather be a rebel than a slave, as if slavery was a choice. You couldn't rebel when you were a slave. It was so insensitive. Because that was a very early suffragettes in America. They, they had that, that yeah, uh, quote. But why didn't, didn't they have some kind of, I don't know, media people to tell them not to do that? But anyway, um, so it was incredible. But what, what is really interesting about this story is that it's what Gayatri Spivak talks, one of our great postcolonial thinkers, she talks about the systematic erasure of otherness and difference. And she calls it an epistemic violence. It's a violence. It isn't just, hey, they've left us out. It's actually a <coughs> violence. And, you know, there's this whole genealogy of women of colour, of people of colour, um, but we don't know about it. And she calls it an amnesia. There's an amnesia. And, uh, and you know, how are they remembered? The only thing that I could find about these women was a statement from the governor of India, the British governor of India at the time, who's, who said this. They're so picturesque in their saris. They're colourful. And um, how, you know, how wonderful they looked. And you know what was very interesting about that? They were seen as exotic creatures in relation to the staunch, defeminized, grey British feminists. So their sexuality and their ethnicity is being juxtaposed to the grey you know, defeminized women who are fighting for justice. So it's so interesting. So what um, what uh, Gary Spivak is saying, actually, no, Chandra Mohanty, who wrote um, Under Western Eyes, which is a great essay you must read if you're doing decolonizing work. She says, Chandra Mohanty says, you know, difference can be acknowledged, but what kind of difference is acknowledged? In what way? So their difference was acknowledged by the governor, but what kind of difference? You know? Or they can be left out, as in, as in the movie, Suffragettes. You, 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 know, you can either be left out, or you're constructed in a particular way. And you have to say, where is our voices? You know? And what it also shows us, how it is impossible to escape the body. Remember at the beginning I said black feminism is about how we centre the body. Um, and even though it's black feminism, you guys, you know, it's for everybody because it is an actual way of thinking about how we structure experience into and suture it into understanding institutions. Um, finish? Yeah, I'll finish. I'll finish, I'll finish with... Um, finish with a quote. See, it was a long talk. <laughs> no, I think maybe several talks. Um, but um, I love this quote by Bell Hooks because we often we often find that, you know, we diss the place we're in. I've just been dissing it for 45 minutes. But, um, you know, she says here, the academy is not paradise, but learning is a place paradise can be created. The classroom with all its limitations remains a location of possibility, a place to demand for ourselves and our comrades an openness of mind and heart that allows us to face reality, to move beyond the boundaries, to transgress. This is education as the practice of freedom. And I leave you with that. <laughs>